It's Feedback Gaming. Welcome back. We're going to start a new series. And it's so it's a requested one that's been requested several times with a kind of a bit of a twist on it. So what people will request of me is to, to do tutorials to how to play Hearts of Iron. And what I'd love to do is to teach you guys how to play the game. But I don't want to do the traditional tutorials because I think they're absolutely long and they're really boring. They're like 20, 30 minutes and they just tell you too much. I think the best way to learn with this game is to jump into the game, play a little bit of the game and watch a tutorial of some kind and then keep jumping back and forth with a game tutorial, game tutorial. So with that in mind, it's so much easier to watch a series than to watch a tutorial. So what I would do is I'm going to combine that. I'm going to combine a series with a specific tutorial and we're going to combine them and I'm just going to play the game normally. So what we're going to do is I've never played the Soviet Union, so let's give it a shot. So, in Hearts of Iron 4, you can play all the countries that exist in World War II. And the country we're going to select is the Soviet Union. Now, don't be intimidated, it is incredibly large, but I find the Soviet Union is quite easy to understand and there's less hurdles that you run into with other specific nations. Countries that I would avoid on a first playthrough would be the UK and France, being the fact that they've got lots of overseas colonial possessions, different divisions, lots of navies to gather up and organize and lots of penalties you start the game with uh, that hinder your ability to uh, play the early game. Now the Soviet Union does start with some penalties as well, but they're nowhere near as bad and I'll kind of give you a guide to how you remove them. So I would say the best thing to do on this specific series is to put it on recruit, which I'm going to do as well just for the sake of this series to make it nice and short. I don't want to drone this on for too long and play the Soviet Union and just do what I do. Okay, so with every paradox game with every grand strategy paradox game such as eu4 victoria you find yourself with lots of tabs at the top so what these do is they give you a notification of where you need to go uh, and specific alerts that need to be dealt with um, and so we're going to lurk from left to right initially so first of all research slots are available you have three research slots available you can either click here on the specific icon or there's the icon here that magnifies research and the hotkey is W. I don't think I've ever used the hotkey. I always just manually click. To be fair, you never need to click on this. You just go for the icons because when your research completes, you get a pop up to be notified what new research you'd like to go for. Um, so you never find you really use this. Anyway, so we're going to click on research slots. You've got three research slots. Different countries start with different amounts. Miners start with two. Uh, majors tend to start with three. And there are some exceptions, like I think Germany starts with four, and I think maybe the United States starts with four. But later in the game, you get other options to unlock more research tiers, so you can research more. So, just a rule of thumb, you can get really confused and look through all these research, but your best bet is to start off on the very far right. And you've got engineering and you've got industry. Now, the reason why you go for that industry and uh, engineering is because you find that the benefits subsequently helped you later in the game they're kind of the earlier you go for them the, the longer the benefit will give you so first of all basic machine tools is a no-brainer you always want to go for that because it unlocks other ones if you go down the tree so you understand here this is 1936 which is 1936 in the top right and you can go for this risk research and then work down the tree and work down the years as well we'll explain more about researching through time as we go on so basic machine tools is what you want to do now I'm not going to talk too much about production efficiency because I don't want to bombard you, but just trust me, more production efficiency is always good. So we're going to research that as the first one. So next we're going to select a different research slot. Next one is construction. Yet again, it is self-explanatory, but it will make more sense when you understand what construction, what you can construct and what you can do with, with construction. And finally, we're going to go into engineering and go for electronic mechanical engineering, which has a result of reducing research time by 2%. Now, if you do hover over this, you do actually see things that can adjust, uh, can modify your research time. So we're on recruit difficulty, so minus 5%. 
export focus minus five percent we'll explain more what export expert focus means later and also you've got day saved so it's day one and they've saved one day for you uh, what you can do is you can save up to a maximum of 30 days in this slot so if i was to make the time go by now and the game progress you can save up to a maximum of 30 days and the minute that you go for the research all that 30 days gets banked and it starts from there so there are situations where the game is quite forgiving for you if you forget about a research slot anyway we need to go for this this will reduce when this research is complete and done every sequential research after it will be have a reduction reduction in research time by two percent and the base one for this is is 100 but some of them get a lot more expensive like this one for instance is 250 days ignore this number because it's modified based on how far in the future this is but look if you hover over it, it says base days 250 so if you take two percent off 250 obviously you're going to get three days less three days that's quite massive and to say the fact that these are going to stack over other researchers as well overall you're going to save days weeks you're going to see months you're going to even save years in research time if you go for engineering early okay so this is pretty much self-explanatory it shows how far the research is done by the green bar running from left to right when it goes to 100 percent it's complete and it's done you'll get a pop-up don't worry about that the pop-up will come up and you'll be able to go for the next research immediately and this shows you how many days are fully remaining until it's complete 35 180 90 also here it gives you a little uh, limited technology bonuses will be listed here and this is what it mentions it mentions research time bonuses the one the two that we've just been through the recruit difficulty and the export focus anyway the next one so the next one is free civilian factories so we're gonna have to explain a game mechanic now so there's two kinds of factories in hearts of iron 4 there are civilian factories and there are military factories now civilian factories are simpler because they're used for for construction and they're also used for importing resources We'll get onto resources later. For the time being, we're going to use our civilian factories to build. Um, well, we're going to build factories. So these are all the things we can specifically build: infrastructure, air bases, anti-air, radio stations, military factories, civilian factories. So you can use civilian factories to build civilian factories. It also shows an equivalent cost as well. Uh, I think the way it's calculated is the maximum amount of civilian factories you can designate to a construction is 15. And every extra civilian factory will be added to the one below it. So, for instance, let's just grab some military factories. And let's just say we'll make some civil military factories in central Russia. So, select like this province. Indicate by the number. Zero means zero of two. So, there's zero military factories, but a maximum of two. Click on it, and it adds the extra construction. We're going to add a total of four by selecting those regions. Here we go. So it shows you the region, it shows how many civilian factories are designated to the construction task of making those military factories. So 15 of 15, the, the maximum. And every day, 15 production of civilian factories will be added to this overall production. If you hover over it, it says the overall production cost. And you see their military factory is zero of, of uh, what, 3,600. So 15 will be added on daily until it gets complete and then it's done and then it'll move down the tree and this will be erased off when it's complete. And also here you can see that the 15, you can only designate a 15 on construction maximum and then every extra civilian factory will go on the one below it. So you can, if you want, adjust them to what order you want them to in if you want to designate a certain construction task. These buttons change the order. So you've got perm. So let's say I want, I want the construction perm to be done first, move it up and it is at the top. Yet again, as we go on, we'll talk more about the construction and what it benefits and what it's gained. The good rule of thumb is to... This is kind of what most players do. Now, it's not what I do. I play a little bit differently. So if you want to cancel these, you can right-click on the map or you can click on the X to get rid of them. Um, what most players do is the start of the game, they make civilian factories. And then as the game goes on, they migrate onto, onto military factories. Uh, yet again, it'll make more sense when we play more of the game and you understand more mechanics. But for the time being, I'm going to play my style and go for military factories from the get-go. Now the question is, Dave, how do I know how many military factories I've got? So the total number of factories in the top here, indicated by the factory icon. And I have a total of 84 factories. We have a total of 36 top possible military factories and 6 naval dockyards. And also civilian factories, 42. It also says on the left, the number indicates how many are actually being designated to a task. So... The question is, I've only got 16, 17, 18 civilian factories that I can use. Now, the question is, where are these other civilian factories? Because it says on here, I've got a maximum of 42. Well, 
a percentage of your civilian factories are used on consumer goods. Uh, as you can see here, um, civilian economy is 30%. So 30% are being removed and being used as consumer goods. Yet again, don't dive too much into deeper. Just understand that you don't get to use all of your civilian factories. Some of them need to be designated um, into your country and absorbed that you can't use them for construction or importing. Yet again, we're going to talk more about importing later. And also to top that off, we'll talk more about what civilian economy means. Anyway, we're done for now. So we're going to be constructing new military factories. When we have any, any military factories left over, it'll be notified at the top with another icon to indicate that there are civilian factories that are not designated. The next one is military factories. We have three military factories, not three, three. Uh, over here, we have a total of 36 and 18 are designated. Okay, so I feel like I might butcher the, the correct terminology for each one of these. I, I guess we could refer to these as lines of production. So these green factories indicate how many how much the factories have been designated to producing that specific item. To make life really easy, what we're going to do is get rid of all, all of the lines of production. So it says you can either left click and remove them individually or you can shift click and get rid of them all. They're all gone. So in Hearts of Iron 4, you produce goods to be added to your divisions. It's either for new divisions or for existing ones that are in the field. We'll go into what you specifically need, but for the time being, I'm going to tell you the essential supplies you will need. First of all, this icon indicates basic infantry and artillery equipment. This icon, and this pulls out here, and it, and it tells you what extra equipment, what equipment are available to you right now. As you research more equipment as the game goes on, you have the option to get more of these items, these units in this slot so you can produce them. So first of all, infantry equipment is the most basic of all, all equipment. You use that for everything. Every single military division on the ground, every troop needs a gun in their hand to fire it. If they do not have a gun, they will be not assigned to that division. Uh, there's that kind of, there's a myth, isn't there, that the Soviets uh, sent troops into battle without guns, hoping that they'd pick up guns from their dead fallen comrades. Apparently that's a myth. Apparently it was the other way around. There wasn't much ammo, apparently. There were people sent into battle with a gun without ammo, apparently. It was the other way around. Anyway, besides that, in this game you can never be assigned a gun. Uh, so you can never be assigned to a division unless you have a gun in your hand. So here we are, an infantry equipment. We'll talk about the specific stats behind it later and what is required to make it, as well as what this production cost means. But just for the time being, understand that this will create a new line of production of infantry equipment. To make things easier for the time being, you're going to probably produce the most on infantry equipment. What's what tends to happen when you start the game of Hearts of Iron, if all your divisions aren't at full strength. Oh, I don't want to talk too much about this because I feel like this could get really, really confusing. Uh, but just understand for the time being, each division, if you hover over it, it says what their strength is. Strength, 85%. It's indicated by that orange bar at the bottom. So... When they're not full strength, that means they need equipment to become full strength. And in most cases, when you start the game, it is infantry equipment that you will need. So what we're going to do is you can see that one military factory is assigned to the production of infantry equipment one. And if you click the full 15, 15 are now designated to this task of producing infantry equipment. And it shows you how much they're producing per day. And it says how many we need into our fulfillment of infantry equipment is fully complete. Be aware, on day one, a lot of the stats are wrong. They're not right. Um, it takes into account the game the previous day. So it's always looking back. So if it says it needs, this is for the previous day. But the previous day doesn't exist. There was no 31st of December 1935. So this number is wrong. As you go on to the next day, this number will change. More likely, it will go up. As each day goes by, you'll produce 15 guns, and then they'll be supplied directly to your troops on the field. Don't worry about how that works, we'll get into that later. Also, we're going to produce some other equipment, such as supply equipment. Designate the factories to that, so we've got 25 assigned now. Uh, we can go for some motorized as well. Dedicate a few to motorized. Uh, what else have we got? We've got some artillery. We're going to designate some artillery. And we've got some tanks as well, which is in this one. So armored vehicles are in this slot. It, infantry equipment, artillery pieces and whatnot are dedicated to this slot. All armored tank divisions are dedicated to this one. Um, and we're going to produce some tanks. There you go. So one thing to note is when you do run out of available military factories to assign, they appear as gray. So 
There are instances where you could take on enemy territory or make new military factories, and when you do get these new assigned, you'll be not you'll be prompted at the top uh, if they're not assigned to you have free military factories. So what so what will happen is if I invade a country or make a new military factories, it will be assigned to one of the grey ones. If it's not, there's not a grey one available. You'll be notified at the top to assign it. And if you have a grey one available, it will assign it when it becomes available. And straight away, they're producing more of these goods. Okay, and yet again, I've told you so much information. I'm not going to go into specifics of like production efficiency and the resources that are used. But we will go into that later. One thing to know is there is one thing on here that appears red. And that one thing that is red is rubber. So we do not have rubber produced in the Soviet Union. And we will need to import that. We'll get to that layer by indicated by this icon. Anyway, if you do want to bring up the production tab, by the way, it's this one. Uh, actually, no, it's this one. Production Y. And it shows you what production you've got. But yet again, if you ever need to look at the production, the game lets you know with one of these icons at the top. So you can designate it to that icon and, and look what to do next. Anyway, so we have naval dockyards. It brings us straight back to the production screen. And it basically tells us we have six naval dockyards um, to produce ships. So... You can look on this list here and you can see what ships are available to be produced. We've got destroyers, light cruisers, heavy cruisers, battle cruisers, battleships, and submarines and convoys. Um, what we're going to do for the time being, just things, things nice and simple, is for the Soviet Union, you don't really need ships. I mean, ships are useful, don't get me wrong. They are good uh, for patrolling areas, hitting enemy convoys, um, and for amphibious assaults. But the Soviet Union controls huge parts of Asia and, and Europe, so you find you don't need to use transports. If you were, for instance, playing as the UK and you were transporting troops from India or Africa to the UK, it would be a really good idea to have ships patrolling these regions to defend your boats. But as the Soviet Union, you don't really need to move overseas. You've got everything in your fingertips. I think there is one instance, uh, I think here, this island, it doesn't have... Um, Access. No, I just think it does there. There's actually a few lines there. No, so that's true. There's nothing that I'm aware of. Actually, maybe this island. I think this island doesn't have access. Yet again, you're never going to find yourself using that icon, uh, the island. Um, yet again, you, you can feel free to how you play Hearts of Iron. You may choose to be in a very aggressive Soviet Union when you're invading the United States. So you might need to do an amphibious assault. But yet again, we'll get onto that later. Anyway. So, what we're going to do for the time being is we're going to produce convoys. Convoys are used for supplies. They're used for importing of resources. Um, what else are they used for? They're used for transporting troops um, overseas. So, what we'll do is we'll assign convoys and same, same kind of formula. Click on the bottom and it assigns all the available naval dockyards um, to this project of convoys. And all the ones in grey will be assigned if I acquire new naval dockyards, either from construction or conquest. Okay. Next one. National focus. Every country in Hearts of Iron 4 has a national focus tree. And on this tree you can select decisions to make that will overall affect your nation. Now they're normally divided into four categories. I say normally because there's, there's different variations and mods that make things a bit different. First of all, you've got a construction tab here that affects construction. It adds more civilian factories, adds more military factories. If you hover over them, they'll let you know what they mean. It adds more research slots, so you get actually more research slots to be added. Um, if you want to actually access national focus, um, I found this a bit confusing when I was new. It's like, where the hell do I get it? It's not in one of these tabs. Like, where do I get to the national focus? You have to click on the flag of your country, which is the hotkey Q. And then you've got national focuses here. Otherwise, if you've got a national focus that you've not selected, you've got the icon here that you can select. But you should really, for the most part, be selecting a national focus. There is an exception to that rule, but we'll come to that another day. So these are kind of political ideas mixed with a bit of research. You've got a uh, specific tailored to improving your army, air force, and navy. And these are ones that are kind of political and industrial and research-based. Um, for the most part, how you play Hearts of Iron, uh, most players do this, they want to get political power. Now, we're going to talk about political power later, what it means and what it does, but for the most part, it's the best idea to go for ones that give political power. And the, the one that they get as the Soviet Union is Stalin's Constitution. Now, all national focuses take 70 days, regardless. 
no change. They're always 70 days. There are adjustments in mods and whatnot, but for everything in standard vanilla Hearts of Iron 4, every National Focus takes 70 days, and there's no way of adjusting that. When you've selected National Focus, you are dedicated to it. You cannot cancel it, you cannot adjust it, you cannot move it. And there are options here, like here, these branches are mutually exclusive. It means you can only select one or the other. So you've got to really make a good decision. If you've selected one and you've started researching it, you cannot move off it, so you're stuck with it. So, Stalin's constitution is the ability to gain 160 political power, which we'll explain what that means later. But we're going to start that project, and that's one less. Okay, so no basic di divisions, uh, there are no divisions in basic training. So, you select here, or you can select recruit and deploy, or you can select this icon. So, these are all division templates. They, they represent... Um, how I guess how you want to play the game. Um, that's, that's the only thing I can I, kind of way I can describe it without going into too much depth. These are all templates for certain kinds of divisions that serve certain roles. Now you can make your own division. It's a division designer. We'll move on to that later. But for the time being, we're going to keep things super simple. We're going to select this infantry division. If you hover over it, it says what it requires. It requires 900 infantry equipment and 24 artillery. Now we looked at production. See, we can actually see what we're producing. 15 infantry equipment and we're producing artillery so we will be able to make this division the game will notify you if you if you're making if you're training a division and you don't have the equipment for it so you can move the production onto it so don't worry about that if you make a mistake but for the most part you're going to select the top infantry and train some divisions so similar to production lines these are kind of training lines so every time you add train here you add a new line of production in this case we're producing uh, training infantry um, so with each line you can add extra units on to dedicate more lines or you can make a brand new line um, there are certain reasons why you wouldn't want to do that if you wanted to prioritize certain lines over the others but for the time being we're going to produce infantry we're going to make two lots of infantry and uh, that's how well that's what we're going to use for the time being anyway so first thing you need to do with the bit in red that says no location set. So over time as the game progresses, this infantry division will be trained and then it will be placed on the map. Now you need to just designate where you'd like this infantry division to spawn, where it would like it to appear. So you select the location and we're going to select, we will select, um, it doesn't actually matter to be honest with you. We'll select just a random place in, oh, I don't know. Is it Belograd? Yeah, we'll select that one division there. That one location there. So when that division fully completes, it moves from left to right. And it's fully trained. This bar indicates, is it getting all the equipment it needs? So it needs, so the percentage of equipment is 0% because it's not been supplied yet. It needs 900 infantry equipment and 24 artillery uh, to, to start producing this division. And this indicates the how much they've been trained until they're complete. So 0% is the not even start, 100% is the fully complete, and if you hover over it, it tells you how long until they're complete. So there you go, 6th of May 1936 is when this division will be fully ready, and it will spawn directly on here in this province that you can see here. And what will happen when this, when this production of this infantry division is complete, um, it will appear on the map, and then it will start producing the next one. Okay. There are lots of other things on that production screen, but we're not going to talk too much about it because we're going to keep things super simple uh, before we move on. Anyway, insufficient resources. So, as we saw on the previous screen, the production screen, it showed an icon in red indicating this tire icon. And this means we're not getting sufficient rubber to produce motorized to the maximum efficiency. So if you're not got the resources, um, as it says there, production will be redundant at reduced speed. So you can hover over the production, which is 3.23 a week, and you can say, what effect is this having, not having resources? And if you hover over that icon, it says that lack of resources is minus 30%. So the production of motorized is being reduced by 30%. So it's not a maximum capacity. You can still produce divisions without any resources. Uh, by scrapping together parts of leftovers and whatnot, and that the maximum penalty of production is 90%. So if you were to produce a division that had no resources whatsoever for, uh, you'd get a 90% penalty. So you'd still produce, but it'd be incredibly low. One thing to note is if you have military factories, you should always assign them, which I have been told several times in my ISIS campaign that you have spare factories and you're not assigning them. And the reason why I was holding back is because of resource issues. 
Yet again, not going to get too in depth here, but you are you don't have rubber, therefore the production has been reduced. So what we're going to do is it's indicating insufficient resources, and it's it'll straight away default to rubber. So you can see here, um, the best thing to look at here is to look at the resource. So the six resources in total: oil, aluminium, rubber, tungsten, steel, and chromium. And you can see at the bottom uh, the surplus. So that means we've got 98 that we're not using. 48 tungsten we're not using so the best way is just look at the surplus and then you can see here rubber uh, we're producing non rec importing non rec exporting non and the needed is three so what you can do is left click on rubber and then this will dedicate and show you what nations have excess rubber that you can import from those countries the first one that appears at the top is the one that has the most of the rubber that is the default yeah they're the ones that have the most excess so this case is the United Kingdom, and if you look really closely, the United Kingdom does have quite a lot of rubber, like 448, uh, four, there's this in Sri Lanka, they've got 116 as well, loads and loads of rubber. And also trade influence dedicate, uh, dictates who gets the resources first. So if there's a country that has uh, only a few bits of resources and there's several countries competing for those resources, the one with the most trade influence will get those resources first. We don't need to worry about that, to be honest with you, because there's so much resources in the map. I've never had that scenario crop up. Um, it does happen as you play as the Axis as Germany, and you find yourself not having the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, or France uh, having any ha having any rubber. So in that case, you find yourself uh, having to get get it from smaller countries that don't have as much. Like, for instance, Ethiopia has one spare rubber. Uh, the British Raj is 16, so you have to trade with one of the miners, and yet again, they'll be competing for, for influence. So there might be instances when you want to adjust how much influence you've got. Yet again, we'll talk about changing your trade influence later, but I don't think it's going to be even relevant. I've never even, I've never even had a situation where I've uh, had to compete for trade influence. Anyway, so you're going to select the United Kingdom, say you want to trade with them. Now, don't worry too much about the information on this screen, but this indicates how many civilian factories you've got to dedicate. Um, to getting uh, rubber from the United Kingdom. So, as I told you, civilian factories have two purposes, construction uh, and importing uh, goods from abroad. So, in this case, we are going to dedicate one civilian factory to get eight rubber from the United Kingdom. Um, there are other things on the screen to worry about. So, if you dedicated more civilian factories, you could get more. But if you click on this icon, it, it just sets it for you. So if you were to, I don't know, be a bit crazy and select too much rubber, if you click this icon, it will set it to how much you actually specifically need. So we only need three, but you can't ask for three. They come in for one civilian factories. Um, you can, um, for one civilian factory, you get eight of that specific resource. If they've not got enough resources to give you, you'll still have to spend one civilian factory um, to get that amount of uh, resource that you need. Anyway, if you click send straight away, we're gonna start re trading resources with the United Kingdom as indicated in green and we've not received them yet because as you imagine it's only day one day two we'll receive it and this icon indicates that you are trading with that country the best thing to see is if you think to yourself am I trading so you can go into the resource screen which is here and every time you have that icon here to cancel all resource imports um, you can take that and it knocks them all off but the truth is it's easy just to, to, to glance over this to see who you are exporting with um, you can see um, you can see who you are trading with, um, so indicates that icon means I'm trading some. I'm trading in some rubber from the United Kingdom. There we go. We're done. That icon's not going to disappear, by the way. And the reason why that icon won't disappear is because the day has not passed. Therefore, we've not received the resources. If you click on it, it still says that we're going to receive eight rubber, but we've received none because we're waiting for the trade, which will complete on the next day. Guys, I understand this has been a long video, and I've literally not done anything. Uh, but the truth is you're getting the basics down of Hearts of Iron. Uh, please proceed on to the next episode to see more, and I'm going to start playing the game soon, uh, talking more about the divisions on the map, talking about the armies, and talking about specifically making your own divisions. Guys, if you've enjoyed this video and you want more, uh, comment below, and also like and subscribe. Guys, I'll see you soon. Goodbye.